Welcome back to Let's Code Live. So, um, if you have been on the stream before, you'll know that I have done Ruby before, but that is what we're going to be doing today. We're going to try to use this reset progress thing. They um, changed the course information or the, the way the tests work or something. I got an email about it saying that there's new content. Um, it, it's basically the next recommended thing because you'll note that I've got 100% here on all of these. Um, so I'm going to try this. This is, I think, new functionality because way back in the day, episode one of, code, of um, Let's Code Live, I uh, attempted to log in with a user that I already had completed a couple of courses on, and it wasn't so easy to reset the course progress. Um, it would just go into the, the current kind of like the last place you were. And if you even started from the beginning, it would already have all your code typed out and stuff, which is not ideal. So let's see how this goes. We're gonna do it right now. Oh, I missed. We're gonna do it, reset. We're gonna reset it. Mm, but not delete your existing code. I mean, obviously I'd prefer to delete my code, but I'm pressing the button. Uh, maybe refresh the page. Bad sign. Suppose I could have tried to do this before scheduling and doing the lesson, but uh, that's not how I did it. Cancel works. <laughs> Actually, I'd rather do Let's see if anybody knows how. All right, let's try this. So we'll we'll go into this, I guess, by going completed or something. Oh, it's not doing anything at all. Oh, it says estimated. Completed. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then I believe it's get help. Nope. I think this is a new style course, so I get help. I want to restart the exercise. Well, actually, I mean, this doesn't look This doesn't look like it has any code per se. That could be because of the fact that there's the new stuff. Let me go back out though. Go to catalog, go to Ruby. Reset progress here maybe? It's doing an Ajax request in the background. I don't know. It doesn't give me any indication that that's happening. But I suppose I can just do what I did before and just click on Introduction to Ruby here and just just start going from the top. Uh, Ruby is a high-level, interpreted, object-oriented, and easy-to-use language. I'm just reading the bullet points there. But uh, that's... That's basically true, although I wouldn't necessarily say easy to use. And I say that because in terms of language design, Ruby is effectively a lisp and is probably not the best starting language for most people. Um, if you wanna learn Ruby, Ruby is the only thing that you care about, um, then by all means start Ruby. It's gonna be easier than starting from like C++ or something like that for sure. But I wouldn't necessarily say it's the easiest to use language 
just categorically. Uh, so there's nothing over here, so we're just going to hit next, moving on through. Information or data can come from different types. Three data types that we are interested in, a number type, a Boolean, and a string. So a Boolean's a true or false kind of a thing. A number type, um, depending on what the number type itself is, could mean anything from an integer, which are the... Um, Kind of counting numbers so uh, 0 1 2 3 4 5 negative integers are usually included in that set as well and then obviously there's there's a more abstract type that would be like floating point numbers so things like 1.2 or 3.14 right both of those are examples of decimal numbers which may or may not terminate depending on what kind of expression you run so if you run an expression or in base 10, you think about a number like one divided by three, uh, that's, a, that's a fraction. Obviously, the floating point representation of that would be one point, uh, or sorry, point three, 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 for as much precision as that floating point number is capable of calculating. <laughs> so we will set my num to the value of 25. We'll just go straight down the list. My bullet is something like true. It could also be false. My string, in this case, we're gonna put double quotes around it and say Ruby. And can we run this? Yes, we can. Now, can we use single quotes, which is always a important, oh my gosh. Okay. Can we use single quotes? Yes, we can. Does not seem to be, at this point, a difference. When we get to doing templating and stuff, there may be a difference. There is in other languages like PHP although there is not in some other languages like Python. Notably, obviously, if you use something like a apostrophe inside of the string, so you want to say rubies like that, then you would need to not only end the string properly, but you actually also need to escape it by putting a backslash in front of it. It's very typical across most languages. I didn't have to look that up. I just guessed and it works. Uh, puts apparently is a output um, expression or function or whatever you want to call it. Presumably onto a standard out or some kind of output buffer. Variables. We saw variables in the prior thing. So, for example, you can define a variable by just saying my num equals 100. So we, we defined it and assigned to it at the same type or time, sorry. And then you can do things like puts my num, right? Or you can do something like my ugh, other num equals my num times um, 0 0.5, so half of it, right? And then you can puts my num and puts my other num run and get out what you expected. Uh, this one, the top one here is was treated as an integer, and I say that because it didn't put out the zero on the end, but even in binary, um, 100 times 0.5 or 100 divided by two is still representable as, as a pure integer and not as a floating point, but it did get cast or upgraded, if you will, to a floating point number, which is why we see this zero here. If we had some in introspection tools or the ability to look at the internal representation of my num and my other num, they would probably be different types or at least have some kind of different flags in internally because of this different difference in representation here. So these are operators. Uh, these are all pretty typical operators other than the exponentiation one. The exponentiation operator is not, not available in most languages. Notably, it's available in Python, but other languages you might be familiar with, such as JavaScript and, or at least I don't think JavaScript has it. Does JavaScript has have that? Uh, two star star two? <gasps> it does. Learn something new. Wasn't even a JavaScript lesson, but you learned it here first. Uh, PHP does not. Uh, don't make me break out an interpreter 
uh, REPL to be able to demonstrate that, but to the best of my knowledge, PHP does not have an exponentiation operator. And for sure, C and other languages like that don't. Uh, they do have s similar constructs, or at least the standard library does, like C has POW, and then it would be the number, um, and then the exponent, something like that. Anyway, moving moving back onto this, do a little math practice in the editor. Okay, so for example, we saw earlier that we could do like my num equals 100, and then we could do like my other num equals uh, my num times 0 0.5. Well, we can also do, um, for example, my other other num equals my num mod something that maybe doesn't divide into it evenly and i say that because if we did like two then it's the my num mod two is going to be zero because it's an even number so maybe three and that should be one meaning if we if we run this we should see um oh nothing oh, okay uh ruby i believe the last statement or last expression is the output and I was expecting to get that but maybe that's only for functions or something like that or if you did do puts and then you wrap that but let's puts uh, my num puts my other num which we expect to be uh, end in point zero right puts my other other num uh, run and what we get was one. This one is an integer one, and it's effectively the remainder of this number divided by three. You could, the more precise way of saying it is that um, my num and three are congruent to one or something to that effect, but it's, it's effectively a remainder. Um, division, exponentiation. We saw that in the JavaScript. We're not gonna bother doing it. Uh, multiplication, division, pretty obvious. And if you divide or multiply in by something like this, so for example, divide by two, let's see if we get an integer or if we get, um, actually, let's change this. We'll write this as three, and then we'll see, we'll, depending on the division style that it does, it could either do casting to a float or upgrading, if you will, to a float, or it could just do integer division, which three divided by two as an integer is going to be one, effectively flooring it. It does integer division. And you'll note three mod three is zero because three is, a, uh, is divisible by three. Moving onwards. Kind of like that we can just always hit next. It's pretty nice. <laughs> we don't have to play around with the, the tests per se. Okay, so string, uh, so the difference between these two functions are, is, is that print won't do any, any additional magic behind the scenes, but puts or put string as it puts it right there, uh, will insert a blank line or rather, rather than thinking of it as a blank line, think of it as a character that represents a blank line. So in this case, it's gonna be like the new line uh, backslash n and characters or uh, backslash r, n, uh, r slash n, which would be a carriage return followed by a new line. They are different and depending on your OS, you'll primarily use one over the other. So for example, we can say print um, first and puts last Put a dot there just because so, we're going to see the fact that print didn't put a new line last did and we really probably want middle here or something like that so what we'll see is first and middle on their their own line and then last the new line that separates these two came from this this middle puts and there is in fact a new line after this one as well Uh, everything in Ruby is an object, which is more or less true. It could also be said that everything in Ruby is a statement. Uh, 
uh, or sorry, is an expression. Unlike something like Python that has statements and expressions where most statements can be, uh, most expressions can be statements. Uh, Ruby and other Lisp like languages are somewhat unique in the programming world because they only, only use expressions and everything is effectively just evaluating expressions all the way down. Alrighty. So because things like the number or string is an ex is a uh, object, then they have properties and methods. And in this case, uh, this is possibly a method, possibly a property. It's hard to distinguish the two in Ruby, unlike other languages where a method would always end with what would appear to be a function call. So it'd be like length, like this, uh, well, a function call notation like so, or a property which would be just dot length. So if we say something like Jared Kype, and you'll note the extra space there, dot length, what do we expect now? Well, we don't necessarily, um, we, we expect it to count the spaces, right? So with this extra space, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And if we run this, oh, well, I guess we got puts that. We get eleven. Like so. There's a reverse. So for example, Jared dot reverse puts control a nice okay reverse not a huge surprise what should might be a surprise is just that it's so easy to do operations like this um, and ruby loves to use little little methods or properties on objects and in fact patches over standard library functionality all the time. There's the ability to do a number and then treat it as if it was like a date. So like you can do like one dot month dot from now or something like that and it'll spit out a date from it. All of that comes from uh, patching or injecting these kind of methods onto the standard library objects. Other languages have that ability for the most part but most languages prefer to be a little more explicit, so they would write their own types for doing date manipulation versus just patching over an integer to treat that integer as if it was some kind of delta time instance. But the conventions of the language kind of allow for this more, this kind of a thing, well, maybe not reverse, but like the, the dot month dot from today or something like that, that kind of uh, manipulation is is usually frowned upon in most other languages, unless you're trying to do specific DSL or meta so-called meta programming. So uppercase, downcase. If you've done any anything in any other language, JavaScript, things like that, this should be no huge surprise. If if you haven't, then it may be new to you. What do we expect? We expect all uppercase, right? Uh, fun thing to try would be, what does it do to UTF characters? And the answer is probably nothing. Meaning, uh, if we got a UTF token, which I have a keyboard visualizer, oh, So if I got a emoji or something like that, and if I can just drag and drop this on down in here, oh, the seal won't even let me put it in here. Sorry. Okay. Well, um, I can't do it because of the limitations in my editor, but I can put other non standard characters, presumably. So like, for example, I can put, Oh, nope. Can't do that. Cause it refreshes the page or something. 
open the specific um, bookmark. It would appear by number. There we go. So what is this going to be in upcase? Well, it just happened. It's like it strips it out. Oh, all right, well, moving on. Try it on your own. Yeah, reset the files. So we're talking about comments, but we're seeing names in uppercase and downcase. And so let's let's write a comment. So we can, for example, say um, all lower single line comment, and maybe all upper up here. And run, and we should get green on this one because we have comments, right? Let me get my chat back up. Nothing in chat anyway. All right. You can write comments that span multiple lines using this equal begin and equal end. So equal begin is a multi-line comment. And I believe you can even start it on this next. Uh, maybe not. Maybe you literally have to be between those two. So um, obviously I'm a comment or something like this and equal end. So let's try to manipulate this a little bit and see if it still works. So I hit run here. You know, okay, so don't want that. And can we run this? That might have worked. Or it might not. It's kind of hard to tell. The, the syntax highlighting seems to indicate that it didn't. But since we didn't have anything like puts in front of it, it appears to need to be on its own line as well. But this does that 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 portion seems to work, but putting something in front of the equal end does not work. So keep that in mind. Probably best to stick to the format they did, which was to leave the app begin or the equal begin on their on its own line. So you can store, unlike some other languages, you can store your variable names with a wide variety of things. Like for example, you can say um, at my var and dollar sign my var and these these particulars between dollar sign and at and stuff they may have special language uh, implications not necessarily actual language implications but maybe like conventions right so that the at might be um, instance variables or something like that I think I've seen something like that I haven't really programmed a lot of Ruby obviously you can, should be able to tell um, other languages don't aren't usually that that uh, loose with their variable names. PHP, for example, has a big one with the dollar sign, unless it's a constant. And um, and other languages like Python and C and stuff don't let you begin with a dollar sign or an at. Perl uses dollar signs, also. So let's make a name equals Eric. Names all lowercase. I assume the all lowercase for the variable thing is a convention. So you could name, do something like first name like this, upper upper camel case or lower camel case or whatever for, this is a pretty typical JavaScript way of doing things. And puts first name. Yep, so it works. So the the all lowercase thing is probably more of a convention that prefers the snake case. So first name. Personally, I think that this is more readable anyway. I prefer to do it that way. Like so. All 
All right, not gonna do that because it's just review. Set the variables sum equals 13 plus 379. Product equals 923 times 15. Quotient equals 13209 divided by 17. And if I run it, we shouldn't, we won't see any output, but we could obviously put some let's product, let's ocean. What happens if we misspell a name that we use in something like this? Undefined variable, just what you, what you would hope, right? So if you don't have an assigned, if you have an assigned value to a variable, then you can't use it. So again, there are methods, you can chain them like this. That's what I was talking about when I was like one dot months dot, dot from now or something like that. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's something like that. You chain them like this. Uh, sometimes this is called a fluent API. Uh, Although that has a special meaning, it's usually when you have some kind of object and it returns itself every time you call a method on it, so you can chain them together. This wouldn't necessarily return the same object every time, so it's not necessarily considered really a fluent API, but the idea that you can chain methods and stuff is, uh, is possible in other languages, including Java itself. Create a single line comment. So we've got single line comment beginning with a hash or bang symbol there. Uh, and so you have a comment. And then we have the equal begin, equal end for multi line comments. Like so. Neither of these have any output, so we wouldn't really expect anything over here. Looks like we're gonna to get to, you to learn string formatting, so let's start that. Oh, not string formatting. Well, I mean, probably string formatting. Yeah, here's some, here's some string formatting going on right here, uh, using the, the hash and then brace and then the variable name. And right here, what we're actually doing is kind of the opposite of puts, we're gets or giving a stream. And chomp presumably will take off white space. I think that that's a bad naming convention. Uh, it makes the language look less ex implicit, so, or less explicit rather. Uh, obviously, it's, it's the same amount of explicitness, it's just that chomp doesn't necessarily mean the same thing unless you are you know, moderately uh, proficient in English compared to something like um, trim would be an ex another example from standard libraries of other languages that take off white space. So, capitalized exclamation point. I don't necessarily know what the exclamation point specific other, uh, is supposed to do, but I think we, we get the idea that probably anywhere there's white space, it's probably going to take the first first letter and capitalize it. So let's do under lowercase everything. So we'll do Jared Kipe. Oh, well, last name. We'll just, we'll see what happens for this, right? And I'll just put Kipe here. Uh, city, where are you from? We'll say Seattle with an upper. Great, so what do we got? Well, we have, for example, um, it only capitalized the first word, so we, that, that we learned, right? And it capitalized both of these, and then it, uh, it did capitalize Seattle, but it didn't matter because they typed that one with a capital. And then it used the upcase that we learned last time to, to do this. And this, keep in mind, this exclamation point here is not what led to that. That actually came from this down here. So then down here, when we got our puts here, we could call this a format string. And in this particular instance, we kind of bind in our variable names here into this format string. 
and then it gets replaced when it actually goes to do this. Uh, fun fact, Ruby has mutable strings. Uh, some languages prefer to keep all their strings as immutable, which has certain performance implications, but having mutable strings has per certain performance implications as well. At some point, we'll get to something called a I forget what it's named, but there's a special type of immutable, a symbol, a symbol type in, in Ruby you can use as, for example, keys for maps or hash tables, and you get a performance benefit if you use a symbol, and the reason being is that a symbol is effectively Ruby's version of an immutable string. So we will print, which gives us the ability to put a string out and then not have a new line character after it. So we'll do what's your first name, question mark. And what we expect out of this is literally just that. And then our program stops executing and we move on to the next bit here. So now we do variable, uh, sorry, not really variable name, first underscore name equals gets.chomp, okay? And again, the chomp part here, I believe it probably says removes the extra line. That extra line actually comes from the user and it's when you press that carriage return. That's that's where where that extra line comes from. And in this case, uh, gets presumably is going to effectively block or control the flow of your, computer, your program until it gets that new line character or until it receives a signal that's higher priority, like a kill command. So we'll hit run, and this time we're gonna to get to type. We might want space here, frankly. Uh oh. Well, actually, I don't wanna reset this. I just want it to work. All right, refresh page. There we go, so now we got this little space there. Makes it just a little tiny bit better of a command line interface. So we can say Jared and um, hit return. And we stopped uh, running our gets and at this point the Variable first name includes the string Jared. And because of the chomp, it doesn't include the new line at the end. So we're gonna do the same thing for some other variables. So I will just copy them and we'll say last name. We don't need to change gets because that's the same, right? We just always want to fill in a different variable name. And what city, I'm just gonna say, and we'll just name this city. And what state? So we'll chomp and then up case, and we'll say like that, and just as a hint. So we're gonna say Jared, type, at all, and WA, and it won't matter because we have no puts. All right, so let's use our string formatting to, to get us that. So. You might imagine that we've learned enough without string formatting to be able to accomplish this task, and that is technically true. We could, for example, write print um, first name, print space, print last name, right? We could do that, but that wastes a bunch of time, and quite frankly, it's not the most efficient way to do that. So instead, 
we can use a format string. So we'll do puts and then in this case, format string, which will be, it doesn't say any specific format. So I'm just going to say you are colon and then we'll use the hash symbol brace first name. I will put a space here just to give him a little bit of breathing room. Last name. And you are from I don't know why that's so hard for me to type city comma state. And I'll make sure that I type that lowercase just so we can see that behavior. And maybe I'll do one lowercase. Oh, oh, I just messed it up, didn't I? Refresh this. I should have just hit the carriage return. I pressed the run button. I don't know why. All right. And we get back. You are Jared Kipe and you are from Seattle. Ah, and the A was capitalized properly. So we can capitalize using the capitalize. What's the exclamation point? Ah, I see. So in this case, the exclamation point modifies the variable itself, which again, we have mutable strings, meaning that we can change the strings values in Ruby. So when you're using the exclamation point, you're opting in to a mutable version, to, to, to mutating the version that you called the upcase or capitalized method on. And in fact, it'll just change it. So for example, if we wanted to, we could, for example, do something like state.chomp and then right here, we could do state dot, um, well, actually, let me clean this up a little bit. I'm going to delete or comment out most of this because I don't want to have to fill it in. And we'll just work with state. And we'll just comment this out with a single line and we'll just print print state. So if we get state run and we say Washington, nope, why is it not working? Great. Do we have to print out before we can see it? Interesting. Let's print first. Interesting, very interesting. I don't know if that's just the special interpreter that Code Academy is using or what, what that's from, but it's it's definitely, definitely weird. So uh, it's called state, I'll type in Washington, all lowercase. Right. And what we get back is Washington exactly like I typed it. The only difference here is that Chomp, um, Chomp took off the new line, but because we assigned it to what the result was of Chomp, then we get the new line cut off. So now we have a couple of things. We can do, for example, state.upcase, right? And without this, this expression is going to just return a new string. And since we didn't assign it, then we get back exactly the same one. If we do assign it like this state, or in this case, reassigning it and run it, then we get back what we expect. Now, if we put the exclamation point here, we're opting into changing state itself, uh, and state meaning the variable name state, like so. 
So that's interesting. It's a new, unique little trick, right? And that's fine. So I did the assignment with upcase already. Let's clean this up just to make, make the, the code work basically the way that it did before. And then that will work the same way it did before. It's nothing to keep you from just doing dot upcase here. And realistically, you don't even need this because it's basically the same thing. Although honestly, uh, if you're going to care, it is technically faster to use the exclamation point because you're, you're changing a string that you've already created rather than creating a brand new string and then reassigning it. But we're talking about nanoseconds differences on a normal computer. Nothing to be so worried about. All right, so what did we learn? We learned that um, you can get string using the gets. We learned about the chomp method, which effectively takes off white space characters at the end. Probably it takes off white space characters from the beginning as well. That's how most kind of trim-like functions work. Uh, we learned about the fact that you can opt into mutable versions of these methods for upcase and then lowercase and things like that. Uh, presumably chomp has the same, uh, same interface, if you will. And we learned about format strings, which are ways to take a string and then insert into it other strings or other variables, basically. All right, and with that, we are going to wrap it up for the day. Next time we will look at control flow, which is how you do um, things like conditionals. So like if something is true, then do something else. And if you like content like this, please feel free to subscribe to the channel. Um, if you have any questions, throw them down in the comments. I like to, I like to see the comments and I like to answer the comments. So until next time, keep coding.